Okay, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure introducing um, Professor Carolina Benedetti for the second part of the distinguished lecture, sorry, the series of lectures of mathematics. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for being back. Um, so, as I said yesterday, so based on the little background I provided you with, I want to tell you about, and I have paid several weeks to produce the drawing I wanted, but anyway, well done. Um, so, I will tell you then, uh, more precisely, the results we have in the direction of volumes of light path. So I hope you remember the definition of light path matrix because it's going to be the fundamental lecture today. Um, and we were left with uh, talking about refinement of normalized volumes, polytopes in particular. So last time I uh, left you with one definition, and that definition was the definition of normalized volumes. So if I have P uh, full dimensional polytope. Uh, then I can define its normalized volume. Uh, which I denoted by BP. And this by definition is its dimension times its volume. It's um, if my polytope is not full dimensional, as it happens with major polytopes, a similar definition can be done. It's just that everything is relative to the affine space where the polytope is in. Uh, but for me, it's going to be enough if we just think um, of the full dimensional definition. Okay. So, um, again, so. The point is that if P has a triangulation tau, and by this I mean I have my polytope P and I subdivide it into pieces without creating new pieces in such a way that the pieces cover the whole polytope and the pieces interact in a nice way. So they are not overlap. We are overlapping or anything, the intersection of the pieces is a break of both of them. So I have a triangulation of it, uh, tau, um, such that, let's say, this has, this triangulation has, I believe, maybe M simplices that cover the whole thing, such that, the normalized volume of each of these things is one. Then, completing the volume of the polytope just uh, can be done by summing how many synthesis I have in my triangulation. But then this is the important part that I can subdivide it in this part. So, given this, then a couple of questions arise. And first, if I'm given P, can I have a triangulation with this property? By the way, this is this, when a triangulation has this property, we refer to it as being modular, because the volume is one. So the first question is, does P have a unimodular triangulation? And um, so in general, no, but LBMs do. And as I said, like a month ago or something, a paper came up proving that any matrix has a unimodular triangulation. Um, and a polytope may have many uh, different unimodular triangulations. The question is, do I prefer one over the other? 
in our case, actually, we prefer a very particular about all the other ones, and so the question is, uh, uh, what tau should I use? And of course, it depends on the purposes. Uh, if my purpose is just to compute the volume, any modular transformation will do. But I don't want to compute just the volume. I want to, I want to actually be able to compute invariance of the polytope. And one way of building lots of invariance, invariance of any combinatorial object, by the way, is uh, try to build a polytope related to your object, and what, uh, a polynomial. And once you have a polynomial associated to your object, that polynomial can produce lots of invariance by use of evaluation. So uh, that's part of the answer here. Depends on what you want to do, or you prefer one over the other. Um, and so, for example, going back again to the hypersimplex, to the polytope of the uniform matrix to four, this polytope has. Uh, I could actually draw two unimodular triangulations of this, but actually I would prefer one of them over the other, and you will see how will I build the one that yeah. So this one unimodular triangulation, I can say, okay, first split it like this, then like this, that one, and another one is if I were to do Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll draw them in a second. I'll draw, I'll draw the subdivisions I care about in a second. Um, okay, so now a quick intro to Erfurt theory. So, since now we want to talk about refinement of volume, I will do this via Erhard theory. In a nutshell, Erhard theory cares about the following. So, you are given a, I uh, will just think of lattice polytopes. And remember what this means is a polytope whose vertices have only integer coordinates, but actually you can do a theory even if you have rational coordinates, but in the case of matrix, they are all lattice polytopes, so that's going to be enough. So given a lattice polytope V, uh, Erhard theory cares about all the integer points that live in the polytope and the dilations of the point. Um, then V, what we call what I will denote by LQT for every t bigger than or equal to 1. This is going to be the function that returns to me the number of points in T to the n that are inside, that are in the t dilation of the point. Okay? So basically, this is a counting function. The counting function for every t bigger than or equal to one. And the main theorem here, the theorem of Erhard, is that LPT coincides with a polynomial in T. So I will just say that this is a polynomial. It's a polynomial in T of degree. Where, just for simplicity, I will talk, I, I will think uh, at the moment that P is full dimensional. Okay. Yeah, again, if P is not full dimensional, everything can be adjusted. Everything can be done relative to the affine space where the point of this. Um, but this is the this is a source of invariance for the point of this. Is, I have here an algebraic object that I can actually uh, play with. Can evaluate and ask myself what does this evaluation of this particular number tell me about my computer? Um, and 
and in fact, and another nice, very nice switch of about their theory is that evaluating this in negative one makes sense, although in principle, this thing was built out of a counting number for each t, uh, bigger than or equal to one. And this counts actually uh, Mm. This counts the number of points in the interior of the pointer. So this is the number of points in the interior of the pointer. And um, I think I hold by a factor. But anyway, there is a there is a a way of interpreting this as a number of uh, lattice points in the interior of the pointer. So just uh, remove the boundary and look at the things that you are left with in the interior. Um, and moreover, if we consider the generating function of actually this, uh, or we refer to this as the Erhard polynomial of the pointer. If I consider the generating function of LPT, which we will refer to as the Erhard series, and this is the generating function of all the entities, this happens to be a rational function. This happens to be a rational function where the denominator is very simple, and in the numerator, we obtain actually a polynomial. So I'm going to write it as H0 plus H1 D, plus blah, blah, blah. And this is a polynomial of degree at most n. Um, and so basically, this relation tells us if I want to know the Erhard polynomial of my polyton, I may know it if I were to know what it is to write. So, in other words, this. A polynomial in the numerator determines LPT and LPT determines the numerator. So now we want to determine the other. And again, the question is which one is better to work with? That it depends on what you want to do. Uh, both of these polynomials have very, very nice properties. And again, if you have one property for one of them, you can interpret what it means in terms of the other. In particular, so fact. Uh, the leading coefficient of this polynomial is the actual volume of the polyton. Um, it's the actual volume of the polyton, yes. And that translates in the right hand side. Uh, so I'm going to just, for uh, simplicity, I will write h of z just to refer, h star of z just to refer to this denominator. And this relation actually implies then that if I were to evaluate this at one, this gives me the normal angle. Of course, all of this needs like a check, but once this relation is established, this can be done. Certainly. Um, and so here is uh, what I'm referring to when I say what is a refinement of the volume of the normalized volume of my polyton. So you see here what this is saying is if I know this polyton and if I evaluate that one, evaluate that one just means sum the coefficients, that's giving you the normalized volume of the polyton. And so it's telling you that the coefficients of the polyton are a refinement of its normalized volume. Um, and so the question, oh, maybe before the question, a uh, couple of nice facts about this uh, polynomial, which actually I will refer to as the H star polynomial. Okay. So this polynomial satisfies also that its coefficients are. Non-negative. Uh, I will 
okay, this is non-negative integer. And this is actually one of very nice results by Um So if you do combinatorics using a polynomial whose coefficients are non-negative integer, you certainly want to know that they come sum. And moreover, since you already know that the sum of them all uh, have a meaning for the polytope, so the question is, how can I then think of the volume of my polytope being kind of split among all these coefficients? Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so the question is. Can we, so the first is, can we compute the normalized volume of any LPM? And the second, can we say something something about H star of any LPM. And here I'm abusing notation. I'm uh, referring to the matrix and the polytope as the same thing, but I hope that that's not generating any confusion. Um, so, what I want to show you is first, how can we do this? Second, in which cases we can actually say something very concrete about this and a way of trying to manage in general the answer for this question. Okay. Um, I should mention that so here I in particular care about the normalized volume in the combinatorial sense. And again for me the normalized volume is I'm thinking of uh, is it possible to find uh, a nice unimodular triangulation so that I can come to see the figure so that in that unimodular triangulation? In an earlier paper that uh, we wrote with Eric Cordilla and Jeff Docker, we actually computed volumes of any matrix, but that computation involves kind of an inclusion exclusion. So it's add, subtract, add, subtract. So it's not really combinatorial, it's not like. It is a projection between the set of objects and the volume. So we are aiming more to a, a more combinatorial thing that allows, this allows us to do this. And actually, I can tell you how to do that. So, so question one. So basically, what we did was uh, the following. First, we use a very, very important ingredient for us. And that's the important ingredient was this. It's a theorem by uh, by Chatelain and Ramirez. And this theorem tells you actually how to subdivide nicely lattice path matrix polytopes. So the theorem tells you. Uh, let me write it, and I will explain it with an example. So if I take a uh, lattice path matrix, which already we know can be determined just if I provide each uh, an U and an L basis, then what they prove is that its matrix polygon can be subdivided in pieces, where each piece is what I call snakes, snakes of the matrix. So let me just give you an example of what it is. So I will take um, this LPM. Um, so I'll take U to be one, two, four, six, and L to be three, five, six, eight. 
And so I get plus one, two, three, four, five, six, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I get this. I get this. Yeah. And so this is M. And what is this? What are these snakes? So a snake is going to be a lattice pipe, a, a lattice path inside this one that goes from here to here too. And you will uh, draw those lattice paths in such a way, a lattice path matrix, in such a way that you do not have two by two boxes. Okay. So it's like a snake, like the game snake from the old Nokia phones. So for instance, I can uh, consider the, the lattice path matrix as this kind of this boundary. That's one snake. So this one here. Uh, then I go like this. Then I can do This here, I can do this uh, from two up, and I have two more snakes. One snake is instead of dipping here, I dip here, and the other one is dipping on both. So. I'm not going to draw them, so here is, let's say it's make three, and here is make four. Okay, I have four of them. What does this mean? This means that here you have a polytop that lives, uh, this polytop lives in R8, and this polytop is something, this is the polytop associated to the matrix. What this is telling you is, this is also a polytope in R8, embedded inside this one, I've each one of them, and the four of them, so say this is the polytope corresponding to S1, PS1, somewhere here you have PS2, somewhere here you have PS3, and somewhere here you have PS4. So this is telling you, it's giving you a subdivision method. It's not a triangulation necessary, but it's a subdivision. So if you care about completing the volume of this, at least you have a first good approach because you have broken it into smaller pieces. And each one of these pieces is more manageable than the big one. So you have a subdivision like this. And so now the question is, how do I compute the volume of these smaller pieces? And so, one of our, oh, I should say actually that what I'm going to talk about today is joint work with Koliak Nawa and Jeronimo Valencia. And so one of our first results is that we actually know how to compute them. And the reason we know how to compute them is because we proved that uh, if you take the set of matrix and you intersect it with, I will throw here a word, or I should say, if you take matrix polytons, but I'm using both, as if they were the same thing. If you were to Think of matrix polytopes and you will ask yourself, what are the matrix polytopes that are ordered polytopes? I'll say in a second what that means. The answer is snakes. So these pieces, the snakes, are certainly matrix polytopes that actually have an extra adjective. And this extra adjective makes it very easy now to compute their volume because uh, this is a creation of Stanley, 
These are polytopes that come from poses. And basically, computing the volumes of these polytopes is equivalent to calculating linear extensions of a pose. So by example, I'll show you what this means here. Uh, this, uh, if you look into our paper, this result is a case-by-case -case analysis, so you have to consider lots of things. But once it's settled, then I know how to compute the volume of this because I know what poses associate to it. And the process I associate to it. So I draw these things here, and what I do is I tilt the poser. So this here becomes like this poser but tilted. So it's going to be something like this. It's going to be this poser. So this partial order has many linear extensions, so it has many total order in, in its elements that, that respect the order of the poses. And those many ways of totally ordering these elements that respect the order of the poses is the volume of this polytope. So the volume of this reduces to calculate number of linear extensions here. Um, so that's our first answer to this question. Use this subdivision and compute the volume of each thing. Check. Okay. Um, check, but uh, if you want a more precise answer, maybe you want to know, give me a close formula for this volume. You certainly know how to compute it, but can you actually tell me uh, what you get? Um, so it depends, like at the moment we do not have a close formula for it, because it's going to depend I mean, you need to know what process you are dealing with and everything. But at least for some cases, I can tell you. But so far, that's uh, like one of the main big steps that we have. And on the other hand, um, we got interested in the defined version of the volume, so the H star. And so for that, what do we need? What do we require? So again, here we used many tools. If you remember yesterday, I had drawn here, uh, I had drawn here a, a Venn diagram that basically plays LPMs uh, in the intersection of many families. So basically, here we had a diagram that says that the LPMs are or the uh, are. Um, alcohol, which I have not mentioned what they are, they are alcohol polytopes. Um, okay, let, let me say they are positive. So I will say something not too extensive about it, but so the thing is that, uh, again, yesterday, one of the equivalent ways of thinking of matrix that I gave you was, I can think of a matrix that's being given by a pair of a ground set and a collection of subsets that are the bases and blah, blah, blah. Or I can just tell you, I have a matrix because I have this polytop whose vertices are 0 and 1 and whose edges are part of the full line and CG. So basically, matrix are what you obtain when you take the family of zero and one polytopes and you intersect them with polytopes that have this nice direction on the edges. In other words, what this is telling you, if you know about the terminology, this is saying. Matrix polytopes are the generalized parameter hedra with the one vertex. Um, and so, in that sense, positive are major polytopes such that these polytopes are certainly major polytopes with the extra property that. Um, they are alcohol. 
and one way of saying that Bayer Alcock is saying that this is the age description. So if I were to give you inequalities for it, what you will see is top of the form xi plus consecutive coordinate x something and bounded by integers c. So all the inequalities will look like a sequence of consecutive coordinates bounded by some integers. That's one way of saying it. There is another way of saying it, but I will leave it like that. Um, but the good thing about this is that because MPs satisfy this property, Alcock polytopes already come with a unimodular triangulation, which uh, gives us already an advantage. And that's very useful because if we are interested on, if we want to know about the H star, so we can approach the question like this. So, how to compute H star of someone, of a polytope. So it really depends on the nature of the polytope, but one technique is a very nice result by Richard Stanley that tells me the following. So, um, so if you have a triangulation that is unimodular and shellable, I'm saying a second, in our context of the then you can compute the H star of your polynomial of your polytope. Um, as follows. So, H is given by the following. So basically, this will come as, and that's going to be the purpose of this graph. You have your triangulation, and your triangulation satisfies these two properties. Uh, I'll tell you in a second a way of thinking of this. But you have these two properties, and computing this will be done by looking at a certain graph, a certain directed graph. This graph is going to be directed, and looking at how many vertices have in degree one. That's going to be the contribution to the coefficient of set that you call C to the one. How many vertices have in degree two? Those many vertices will be the coefficient of C squared, uh, and so on. So basically, this is V to the incoming whatever. So basically, what I'm saying here is the following. Um, if you take your triangulation, you have the, the simplices in your triangulation. Those simplices in the triangulation will become vertices of a certain graph. You have a way of directing that graph, and that way of directing is what has to do with the shallow part. You have a way of directing your graph. Then you start counting uh, for each vertex how many edges arise to them, to that vertex. And depending on how many edges arise to that vertex, so that's the i of x here, incoming of x here. And so if you want to figure out what is the coefficient of z to the i, just count how many vertices have i in combination. That's basically what this result is saying. So, for example, um, maybe, yeah, I will do it here. So the picture I tried to do here is uh, if you were to take the uniform matrix to six, you 
you were to take the uniform matrix to six, you can triangulate it using the alpha of triangulation. And that alpha of triangulation is giving you a bunch of simplices. Each simplex here is one of these dots. And I actually. So this is this each one of these edges is one of the dots. Forget about the edges that join them for a second. So you have the um, the simplices that represent that give rise to the alpha of triangulation. We have subdividing this one. Um, if I just consider my polytope triangulated and I count the pieces that give me the volume, but for the purpose of the H star, I should have a way of uh, thinking of the simplices as being ordered, as being ordered somehow. And I cannot really get too much into the detail, but basically, uh, recurring at the arc of triangulation, what we manage to do is the following. So say here you have, this is one simplex in your triangulation. How do you know that a simplex is next to another one in the triangulation? So how, for instance, how do I know that these two are far apart? These two are far apart because their set of vertices is very different. Whereas these two are next to each other because the, the set of vertices of uh, both of them is equal except in one. So if this vertex has, so this actually has dimensions, um, dimension seven. So each vertex here is a simplex with eight vertices. This simplex here is a simplex with eight vertices. Of the eight vertices of this one, seven are the same as this one. So they just differ by one of them. So they, they are adjacent because they just differ by one simple vertex. And that, these are the adjacencies here. I determine the adjacencies here, but that's not enough to determine how to orient this graph. And the orientation is the fact that this triangulation can be ordered, or the synthesis can be ordered in a way that produces a shape, but I don't want to get into that. But basically, we are able to orient this in a nice way. And that orientation then is going to be enough to compute the H star. And in this example, actually, um, in this example, so without giving you the whole orientation, so if we go back here, in here, we already knew that the polytope U to six could be subdivided into snakes. Right. The next thing that we did was now take each snake and triangulate it. That's what that's what this picture is. Like behind this picture, you have snakes being triangulated. Where do the snakes show? So if you were to think of U to six, this is U to six. Uh, this is U to six, and U to six has. Uh, has four snakes. So here is one, here is another one, here is another one, and here is another one. It has four snakes. So if I were to take the whole polyton, in principle, I am partitioning it into four pieces. Each, each one of those four pieces is a smaller matrix polyton that lives inside it. A matrix polyton covers all these four snakes. And what happens here is that. So the orientation we give, I'm going to draw here the snakes. The orientation we give is actually induced by an orientation in the snakes. Oops. Sorry? Yes, exactly. Uh, like this, and then this. 
So what I'm saying here is, again, think of this whole picture. This is the whole polytope. And then each piece here is a, a simplex in your polytope. But you know that each one of those simplex lives inside one of these planes. And basically, in this picture, what we manage to do is order the simplices in such a way that it reflects the order on this plane. So more or less what's going on is that I have four snakes, and it's like I have here four pieces that reflect that partition in this movie. I'm not being super precise with my picture, but basically just to show you that the subdivision of the snake is reflected completely in the graph. And then the orientation more or less comes from this way of ordering the snake. And so there is a very natural way once you have done this to orient. So the shelling corresponds to the ordering of the snakes, but there's more just simple, but each ordering of the snakes has multiple. Yeah, so, so what we take, so the, the shelling really is a linear extension of And so once this has been ordered, so uh, you already know how the, each one of the edges is oriented. And once you know the orientation of all the edges, you can compute the index of each pair. Um, and so you can do this. Okay? What's the advantage of that? So here, let's do it for, let's do it for U to 4, which actually we can do completely. So, so here is u to 4. And so first, let's figure out what is the decomposition of u to 4 in terms of snake. Okay? So for this, I need to get right the, the vertices. So, so I'll put them here. Uh, so this is one, two, or the base corresponding to the base is one, two, this is corresponding to the base is three, four. And here we have two, three, two, four, one, four, and one, three. One. Okay. And so this polytope has, and here is the polytope. This polytope has only two snakes, okay? So I have here one of them, and I have here the other one, okay? So these two snakes are telling you, you have this polytope, and this polytope is going to be split in two. One subpolytope will be coming from this, another subpolytope will be coming from this. But now it's very easy to tell in this very small case because Let's look, what is the polytope corresponding to this matrix? The polytope corresponding to this matrix, you have to enumerate all the bases and take the incident vector, blah, blah. But notice that this matrix is just lacking one of the bases of the big one. What basis is lacking? One, two, right? So remember here I have one, two, but here I don't have one, two. So one, two, two, the basis of that. Of it, the others are. So it means that this guy is this upper portion because you have to get rid of the vertex one. Okay. And here you notice that the basis that we are missing is the basis 3 4, and it's precisely chop off this vertex, and you are left with the bottom part. So the subdivision of the matrix polytope into four induced by this name is the one that tells you cut like this. Okay. You could and you just shell the bottom. And then exactly. And then so so this is one subdivision of this matrix polytope, it's not the only one, you could do something like this as well. But the one induced by this name is this one. Okay. If you have uh, some polytope that is built up out of uh, a bunch of matroid polytopes of snakes, is it itself necessarily a matroid polytope which can get to be If you have a bunch of snakes? Like 
you take the matroid polytopes of a bunch of snakes, matroid polytopes of a bunch of snakes, and you build them up in a shellable way to another polytope, let's say, is it necessarily the case that you're going to get from uh, uh, the LPM? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure. Okay. So, and so the reason is that one problem that now we're interested in is with LPM, something very nice we're getting is on one hand, we have a subdivision into matrix polytopes of, of the same family. And on the other hand, we have a subdivision in terms of order polytopes and combine uh, these uh -huh. of our reports. So one question would be, forget about LPMs, take, some, take a different family of matrix. Can you get a subdivision of a piece that are of the same type? And such a way that that subdivision I don't know, something like all the points that are not different. Um, there are some matrix polytopes that can be subdivided into order polytopes, but do not have a matrix of subdivision. So, um, to answer your question, I don't know. I am hesitant that it can be. Oh. I mean, if you have all the snakes, you could tell if they give rise to uh, an LPM. I don't know if a uh, matrix polytope. And yeah, so and then from here uh, to do the whole computation of the H star, which we already know what to uh, what what it is, but just to illustrate. So this first part corresponds to this concept. This other part corresponds to this concept. This concept here, in the same as this, this concept has two linear extensions, which is A to C. So one linear extension is A to C, or the other one is A to B. And the same as this one, right? Permit this as we want, and this as we always on top of them. So these two uh, linear extensions gives you two simplices in the subdivision of this. So Already the top part is a square pyramid, and that square pyramid is actually being split into two synthesis, which one of them is this like this, and the same with the bottom pyramid. It's going to be subdivided into two synthesis because it has two different extensions. And as for the orientation of the graph, so uh, basically what we did was come up with a combinatorial interpretation of how to, how to think of each one of these vertices instead of carrying over all the information, what snake they come from and everything. So what, um, what is it that we use? We use the following. So it is known that the volume of UKN, or in particular U2N, this comes permutation uh, of n minus one elements with one descent, uh, with two descent. Uh, permutations with one descent. And so basically, what we end up doing was the following: we know that. If I focus on the case of Lie Spot matrix of rank two, any Lie Spot matrix of rank two will be inside the corresponding uniform matrix of rank two. So here, Q26 contains all the Lie Spot matrix of rank two, um, of rank two of its elements. Okay? And so, if we know what the whole picture for the uniform, what can I tell about the picture of a given lattice path matrix? So for instance, think in terms of the whole uniform matrix, you care about this lattice path matrix. Can the triangulation that we have here for you to see be used uh, to determine the H star polynomial of this? So certainly, because this polytope lives inside this one, 
the volume of this one will be delta not equal to this one. You are, you are, you are removing stuff. But here you have more information because you have ordered the synthesis in a very specific way, and that ordering of the synthesis allows you to compute the H star polynomial of the whole unit. And so the question is, with that uh, picture that you have for the whole unit, can you compute the H star polynomial of this model? And so uh, again, since we know that. If you were to, actually, I'm going to write it here. If you were to write down what is the actual H star polynomial of U to six, you will get it. So H star of U to six is the following. Um, It's 1 plus 9c plus 16 d squared plus d cubed. And what that means is that in this picture that I didn't finish, you will have one <coughs> vertex whose integral is 3, so one, one simplex uh, uh, that is pointed by three arrows. You will have 15 simplices or 15 uh, vertices in this graph mm -hmm. that have in degree 2, 9 within degree 1, and this sole one which has in degree 2. So that's, that's what that means. And if you were to, uh, if you were to add the coefficients of this, so if you were to evaluate at d equals 1, that gives you the normalized volume of this polytope, which in this case is the uh, twenty-six. It means there are twenty-six permutations uh, that have only one descent on five elements. Okay. And now, out of that picture, you want to know what is the H star of this thing. And so intuitively, what you want is get rid of the stuff that do not appear here. Intuitively, that's what you want. In the practice, what does that mean? Imagine you have your polytope, and the things you want to remove really is like you have your polytope and you are cutting by a hyperplane and removing stuff. If you do that and you don't care much about what you are doing, you may end up cutting in the wrong way. So cutting in a way that destroys or does not give you a triangulation of your small polygon. So you need, you need to remove, st remove stuff very carefully. And the good thing is that we can do it very carefully given the orientation we provided. Given the orientation we provided and given the fact that we know how the polygon is being uh, subdivided into snakes. And what I mean by that is if I care about this guy, so let's look in here what's the contribution of the snakes that this guy does not contain. So this guy does not contain these two snakes. So what I want is get rid of the snakes it does not contain, and then it's going to get rid of the thin pieces uh, that I want to get rid of. And in our picture, we can actually detect exactly what are those things we can get rid of. Because in the end, really what we get is like this sequence of snake, a snake is giving us like a cake, and this cake is filled by layers. This is the bottom layer, and so on. And so if I care about something like this, I need to start removing things from the top layers with a thesis. Removing things from the top layer is not going to destroy what is below. And so here the top layers are like the, the things that appear in the rightmost part of the diagram. And so in that case, removing this is remove all this stuff. Removing this is the next upper layer. And then whatever you are left with. And the incidence, everything works out. Everything works out. And so if you were to do that here, you get 
something like this too. Because you get rid of lots of stuff, you get something like this. Um, and so this is a, this is very particular in the sense that, okay, if I again think of the layer of the cake picture, removing things from the top part of the cake is easy. If I remove the next top layer of the cake, it's easy. But what if I want to remove things from the bottom part of the cake? If I do that, I destroy the cake. That's bad. So what I mean is, what if you want to consider, say, something like this? Something like this will be remove something from the body. Because now what you are getting rid of is some snakes that appear from the bottom up. That's problematic because it's not easy to see what happens when you remove things from the bottom with the incidences. Uh, things may get altered in a bad way. The good thing is that we manage to overcome that problem and basically uh, the result in that direction is the following. So that uh, maybe maybe let me illustrate with an example. Suppose I want this. Although it's a name, but let's just think of this as I have an SVM where I have removed things from the bottom and things, things from the top and things from the bottom. So just thinking in terms of diagram, this can be think of as take this and intersecting with this. Like in terms of diagrams, it's just this. Okay. In terms of polytopes, how do we manage to obtain a pH star of this given this? Or again, this kind of thing does not present a problem. The moving from the top does not present a problem. It's just removing from the bottom does. So what can we do? We can appeal to matrix duality, and basically this thing here is isomorphic to what I would do if I were to consider the dual picture of this, like turning it upside down, kind of. So the the thing of removing from the bottom can be overcome, but think of the dual matrix. And if you not the dual picture, I shouldn't say dual matrix. Anyway, it's a dual a dual picture. I shouldn't use the word dual matrix because that would be. But anyway. Think of this diagram instead of this one. And if we do that, then our result is that if you take an SVM of rank 2, then each H star polynomial. can be written as, I'm going to call this piece A, and this one here B, so it can be obtained by H star of A plus H star of B minus H star of the uniform. So it, there's an inclusion exclusion involved. Bottom line is that computing the H star of this still can be expressed as taking certain set of permutations uh, with one descent. So you, you are not taking all of them, you are taking some of them. Okay. And this, uh, this is the case for uh, rank 2. For rank 3, we can do something similar, but the thing is, lots of inclusion exclusion starts appearing and it gets messier every time. Um, so, um, 
thing that what I wanted to tell you about uh, volumes of LPMs and, and refinements, so I think I'll stop here.